Okay, good morning and uh, hello everyone. My name is Chris Freeland and I'm a librarian at the Internet Archive. And I wanna welcome you to today's webinar, What If You Could Wander the Library Stacks Online? This is an introduction to the Open Library Explorer. So for those of you who are new to Open Library, the mission of the project is to provide a web page for every book ever published. And over the next 30 minutes, you're gonna hear from Mech and Drini, who are two engineers at the Internet Archive. And they're gonna, um, they've been developing a new ways of exploring the 4 million digital books that are now available through openlibrary.org. So as we get started, I wanna share the results of the informal poll that we ran as people were gathering. So uh, let me end the poll here and let me share these results. So here's, uh, the, the results were great and uh, uh, thanks much for participating. What this shows is that many of you are new to the open library as a whole. And so we're gonna adjust our talking points accordingly. Um, and uh, thanks much for participating. So let me stop that share. So here's the game plan for today. You're going to hear more about Open Library from Mech, who is the project lead. And then Drini is going to tell us about the Open Library Explorer, his inspiration, the problems he was trying to solve, and then do a live demo. Now, we'll be taking questions at the end, so please use the Q&A feature of the webinar to submit questions. Submit them in the moment, and we might be able to answer them live via chat, if not uh, gather them uh, live at the end. Now, we are aiming to wrap our main presentation within 30 minutes. So for those of you who need to dash off to the next meeting, go for it. We, um, we will be keeping going with the questions for those of who can stay on. Now we will be recording the session, including the extended Q&A, and you'll get an email tomorrow with a link to the recording. And a final pro tip, Zoom has different settings for gallery view and speaker view, and you might find the speaker view uh, a good way of watching today's session because we're gonna do a lot of screen sharing. So with all of that out of the way, please help me welcome Mech to the screen. Over to you, Mech. Hey, Chris, thanks very much. Howdy y'all, my name is Mech. I'm the program lead for the Internet Archives Open Library. To help us get oriented, if Wikipedia is the internet's encyclopedia, the Internet Archive is really the internet's library. And the role that Open Library plays is as the internet's librarian, cataloging the world's books online and linking every learner to the most relevant ones for them. It's a community effort. Every year, more than 100 volunteers refine Open Library's wiki catalog, spanning nearly 30 million works. More than 2 million of these titles are available to read or borrow from the Internet Archive's controlled digital lending library. Uh, if it's all right, Chris, I'd love to share my screen for just a second, and I can give a very short tour of what the Open Library looks like for uh, at-home learners, parents, and researchers. Please do, go for it. Okay, coming across okay? It is. Wonderful, so this is openlibrary.org. It's one of the services offered by the nonprofit Internet Archive, and it's a book catalog of every book ever published. As I mentioned, it's an open source community project, which means anyone from the community can contribute to the catalog and improve it over time. It also serves as a library portal. Uh, so here you can see that in addition to being a catalog of books that we may not have yet, it's also a catalog of books that we do have uh, digitized at the Internet Archive. And so some of them are freely readable, which means that they are unrestricted or possibly in the public domain. And you can click through on one of them. It brings you to a book page where you can search inside the book. You can read the book directly from your browser. Uh, there's an option to have it read to you using Google's high quality uh, audio text to speech. And if we don't happen to have a book yet, you can express your intent by clicking want to read or organizing it on one of your other reading lists, uh, which can then benefit the, the community. And when you do click read, you pop right into the book and have a beautiful experience where you can uh, just flip through the pages and search inside and all of the other affordances that you would expect from uh, a, a library. Now, uh, as our allies, physical libraries and schools across the, the globe are closed 
uh, closing their doors because of the coronavirus, Open Library is doubling its commitment to bridging the gaps and supporting online learners and teachers from their homes. To show you how Open Library is weaving these essential services into the web, I'd love to introduce you to my teammate, Trini Kami. Howdy, everyone. All right, let me start sharing my screen here. OK, is that coming through all right? Mm -hmm. Perfect. OK, so hello, everyone. So uh, just one second. OK, so hello, everyone. So the way I'm going to go through this uh, talk is I'm going to give a quick introduction of myself and the motivations, and then a demo of the Library Explorer. I'm going to go into some of the details behind classification systems and how they make Library Explorer possible. Then I'm going to demo some new things that we added to Library Explorer that will be being released in the next week or so. And finally, some concluding remarks, open questions, and future works before we get into the Q&A portion. So hello, everyone. My name is Drini. Nice to meet you. Uh, I'm a software developer at Open Library at the Internet Archive. Um, and I'm also a recent graduate from the University of Waterloo. Uh, there, I had the wonderful opportunity to work with Dan Vogel and Fabrice Matulik at their Human Computer Interactions Lab uh, and publish a paper on pen tablet interactions. So I'm very passionate about software and computing and about finding new ways for us to interact with software that lets us do more. I'm also very passionate about libraries. When I was a student at university, I always loved wandering through the endless shelves of my school's library. Something about seeing hundreds of books on everything from Napoleon's Battle at Waterloo to covalent bonds always made me more calm. I mean, if somebody could spend 600 pages talking about covalent bonds, then maybe whatever I was worried about wasn't as problematic as I thought it would be. And I would always leave the library having discovered something that I didn't know existed. And that's something I haven't been able to replicate online or on Open Library. So on Open Library, like most sites, you'd have the option to navigate using subjects or authors or searching. Uh, but these all act sort of as a front desk of a physical library, a facade. They all require you to already know what it is that you're looking for. There's no way to sort of deep dive yourself into the forests of humanities knowledge like you can at a physical library. The other way modern websites solve this problem is through recommendation algorithms. So this is some, what YouTube or Netflix do. This works, but because those algorithms are based on the history of what you've already seen, uh, it's difficult to be exposed to things that are completely unknown to you because they're based on your history. There's no really great way of objectively, systematically, and feasibly exploring unknown fields. And the last thing I love about libraries is that they're always beautiful, like whether they're trying to be or not. Uh, something about the endless rows of, of uh, bookcases and the repeating books and the repeating shelves just makes them visually pleasing. And on top of that, most libraries are specifically designed to be beautiful and inspiring, immersive places where you can learn. That's something else I've had difficulty finding online. There's no really beautiful place for books. So those are the sort of goals that uh, I wanted out of the Library Explorer. So I wanted a beautiful place for books online. Uh, I wanted an object objective way to get the lay of the land of human knowledge, or at least a more objective way. And then I wanted, um, wanted to be possible for people to move through it freely. So without further ado, let's see how close we got to those goals. So this is the Library Explorer. Oh, let me just exit here. This is the Library Explorer. And the way you navigate the Library Explorer is in two dimensions. You move left and right to move through different adjacent classes. So here, the class for religion is adjacent to social sciences, language, and we see all the top level, level classes are adjacent to one another. And then when you move down, you go through subclasses. So under science, we have general science, mathematics, astronomy, physics, and so on. If we're interested in, say, astronomy, we can jump into its subclasses using the arrow keys here. So under astronomy, we have astronomy and allied sciences, celestial mechanics, techniques and procedures, yada, yada. We can use the little index icon here to view a listing of all of its subclasses and jump directly to something that it is that we're interested in. 
And finally, the last way to navigate is using the little expand icon. So what this does is it converts all of these sub subclasses into a new bookcase, into a new astronomy bookcase. So if we press that, we see that celestial navigation now gets its own shelf and all the other sub subclasses are their own shelves as well. And if we scroll to the top, we see that this bookcase is now an astronomy bookcase and we've moved deeper into, into science. You'll also notice that the adjacent bookcases have changed. Now, next to it is mathematics, which was previously just its own, a single shelf, but now that's also been expanded to an entire bookcase. The phrasing we like to use is that now we've moved into the science room. And so all of those shelves that were previously in the science bookcase now have their own uh, now have their own bookcase, so you can dive deep if this is something that you're interested in. And to go back, you can just hit the go up button here. So that's the core of the way you navigate Open Library, or, or, or the Library Explorer rather. Uh, and now I'll go into some of the. Oops, I should be on this tab here. And now I'll go into some of the options that are available. So one of the options is filtering. So for example, if you're looking for children's book you can transform the entire library explorer to only show children's books. Oh, well, that's not expected. Maybe I should go back to where I was. Well, there we go, now it's working. Uh, so if, if we go back to sciences where we were earlier, we'll see that we have the same structure that we were familiar with earlier, but now it's just for children. So all the books are books that have been labeled as for children. Let me reset that. You can type any custom filter here that uses open library for searching. So if we wanted say biographies, we could do subject biography. And biographies are always kind of an edge case in classifications because biographies can exist anywhere. Like you could have biographies about a scientist as much as a historian or an engineer. But now you have the whole library is full of biographies. And you can just browse through all of the people and pick someone you want to spend some time with and learn more about. Some of the other visual settings we have here are the ability to view the books in these sort of 3D forms. So if I select the 3D option here, you'll see that they have, uh, they, have they now have three-dimensional structure. They're little cubes with, uh, with pages. And the amount of pages you see here on the side is proportional to the actual length of the book. We can also prop the books up on their side to replicate the look of a physical library a little closer. And now if we zoom out in our browser, and as all the books slowly start loading in, uh, we, have, we have kind of a pleasant little view that's very nostalgic to, to a physical library. So that's Library Explorer uh, as it currently is in a nutshell. And then if I press the last option here is the feedback option. So um, please do try it out. And if you have any feedback you wanna give us, hit the feedback icon to go to our Google, Google form and provide us with any feedback. We love reading people's feedback and we do use it to drive development. So that's a great way to uh, support us. Let's jump back in here. Now I'm gonna dive a bit into classification systems. So the sort of technology that makes Library Explorer possible. So we realized uh, last year that classification systems contain embedded within them over a hundred years worth of librarian experience, excuse me. And we realized that all that data, which is in our metadata records right now is largely being unused and inaccessible to your average reader. So last year, we made it possible to search by these classification systems on Open Library. So you can search by Dewey Decimal Classification or Library of Congress Classification. And to talk uh, and to give a quick example of how these classification systems work. So let's take a look at an example of Concise Guide to Jazz, which has Dewey Decimal number 781.65. The way this works is that each character denotes a different subject in a hierarchy and it gets more and more specific the longer the Dewey Decimal number is. So for example, here we have the 700s, what we had as a bookcase in Library Explorer, representing arts and recreation, eight being music, general principles, and so on. And so we get a big, 
uh, path and tree describing the specific book. Library of Congress classification is similar, uh, but they're a bit more complicated to parse. Instead of each character representing a deeper level in the tree, we have ranges represent those subjects. So for example, the M is music, literature on music, and then we have ranges of numbers represent different subjects. So I'm gonna end uh, on Library Explorer. We can also switch between the two. So Dewey Decimal or Library of Congress. And as it loads in, we see that the whole library now is transformed with different, uh, different orderings. So we'll see it's a completely different system of how the books are organized and placed in their different positions. Uh, one thing that's an interesting technical detail with Library of Congress classification is that by default, these aren't sorted correctly by computers. So computers use, usually use something called lexicographical sorting, which is sorting like words are sorted in a dictionary, which doesn't work for Library of Congress classifications. You'll see here on the left column that A2 gets sorted after A111 because it's treating these as words. Whereas what we actually want is we want the two to sort of be treated as a number so that two comes after one, but is less than 11. We came up with a solution to this that we're calling fixed width prefix Library of Congress. So if you've ever had to have Library of Congress classifications in a spreadsheet or something and tried to sort them, you know that sorting doesn't work by default. But if you represent them as this fixed width prefix format, uh, which basically expands each part of the Library of Congress classification to be as wide as it can be, then lexicographical sorting works. I won't get too much into the details of this, but in a nutshell, this will sort correctly up to and including the first cutter number. So if I go back here, everything after the dot here, uh, this stuff will sort up to and usually including the first cutter number, the part after the dot. So why does that matter? Well, so let me go back here and give a quick demo of some of the new features that we have. So we'll see inside the staging environment, uh, we have a new sorting menu, which lets us sort how the books appear on the shelves. So by default, they're sorted by most editions, but we can now sort by shelf order. So this will sort by the classification. And we see that the 500s are now in the correct order. And if we expand this shelf so that we get a bit more, um, a few more numbers, we can see if we can find any decimal numbers. Okay. Not on this one, but that's okay. So the numbers will increase as the decimal numbers come in as well. And all that work for Library of Congress is also reflected here. So if we switch to Library of Congress, they're also now sorted correctly. Oh, assuming I select shelf order. And yeah, for the first few, it doesn't show a huge impact because they all start with FC. There we go, FC 23, and so on. Some of the other features we've introduced is we've also made it possible to filter by language. So if you're only looking for books, say in German, we can see how that will work. You see books that have copies in German. So a lot of these have English on the title, but they, it means they have copies available in German. And we had some feedback that saying the covers from the feedback form saying the covers were a bit uh, visually distracting at times. So we have created an option to also view the books only with their title on the cover without the image. So there's, so those are some of the new features we have enabled that were enabled by uh, some of the work for getting those sortable Library of Congress classifications and Dewey Decimal. And now I'll start wrapping up with some open questions uh, that we have for our current interface and some things we're hoping to do in the future. So one of the big open questions whenever you start talking about classification systems is how to handle bias. So the classic example of those are, for example, the religion section in Dewey Decimal or the literature section. In the religion section, if you look at its subclasses, you can see that about like 80% of them are about Christianity or Christian themes. And for literature, you can see that about like 70% of the first subclasses are about like um, English, uh, European literature. 
Um, so this is problematic, but I would argue that it's at least more transparently biased than say something like YouTube's algorithm. Uh, because you can see the entirety of religion, so all of those subclasses, you can tell that things are missing or that things are off. Whereas on YouTube, there's no place where you can see any sort of a complete picture of any chunk of YouTube. So you don't know what biases are there. Also, YouTube's recommendation algorithms likely bias their own content to match the biases of their users so that they only see things that they're interested in, which uh, which brings up some questions about what is a bias and what is a preference, but that's a whole other can of worms. Um, another thing that with Library Explorer is that because it's classification agnostic, if a new classification system comes along that's less biased, we can always switch to it and reap the benefits. Another op open question is who's the authority on these Dewey Decimal classifications uh, and Library of Congress classifications associated with books? So these are usually printed by, say, the Library of Congress inside the book. But for older books, um, you'll often see them penciled in by librarians who have added them at some point in history. Uh, and then for some books, they might not have ne ever made it into the Library of Congress where, and they would have never been giving the classification. So who's responsible for adding those? Also, these classifications have evolved over time. So for example, the 040 section in Dewey Decimal is no longer used, but all of the books there are still there and still classified as 040s. So who's responsible for determining what the new Dewey Decimal classification should be for those books. And then some of the things we hope to do in the future, uh, treating classification nodes as open library entities. So uh, if, you have, if you're new to open library, you might be surprised to learn that you can actually edit, all our users can edit our metadata records and help uh, provide fixes and improvements and add things that we're missing. We want to create sort of a similar page for classification nodes. So for example, for the 781 section, we want to make it possible for users to add the label, add the label in their own language, add deeper nodes to it so that the, our classification depth can increase um, and, and sort of democratize that editing process. More open library integrations. So one of the things we really want is the ability when you're looking at a book on open library to jump to that book's position inside Library Explorer. So we have a quick demo of that. So that little concise guide to Jazz Book. If I do jump to its, if I jump to its uh, Dewey Decimal number, which is 781.65, uh, we have that mostly working here on staging. And let's see. There we go. So now it's gone straight to the correct shelf, to the correct room. And we see jazz and blues. And if we load next, we see lots of books about jazz. And the other thing to note is that these books aren't curated by an algorithm or anything like that. These are assigned, were assigned by human librarians. And there's our concise guide to jazz book. And all these other books next to it are books you're very likely with very similar subject matter, which you might be interested in if you were looking for books about jazz. And of course, the same thing works with uh, Library of Congress. Um, and you get the same sort of experience walking through and seeing books in that order. Jump into a book. So this is a, a fun prototype that was created by uh, Jim Shelton, one of the designers at the Internet Archive, that shows basically, oh, one sec, if this will play. It looks like that video is frozen. There we go. That basically shows um, the ability to jump straight into a book from the Library Explorer without leaving it, to replicate that experience of a physical library where you can just take a book off the shelf. There we go. The other thing we want to implement is Wikidata integration. So Wikidata has lots of wonderful information about authors, including things like uh, gender, country of birth, country of citizenship, lots of statistic data like that, amongst other things, profession. Um, and we'd love the ability to filter the library explorer by those parameters. So you can get like a, a books by French authors or something like that. We've integrated with them a little bit for a past project which lets users analyze their reading history based on those parameters to see, for example, how many books they've read uh, by men versus by women and so on. So getting that integrated into search would be wonderful. And finally, partnerships. 
So for example, the Biodiversity Heritage Library, which is a partner of the Internet Archive, has over 200,000 books in their collection. Well, by using the filter option, we can specify that collection and suddenly the Open Library Explorer becomes the Biodiversity Heritage Library Explorer. So now it's all their books that are shown uh, here with all the same options and configurations. So finding more ways to sort of customize and integrate with partners is something we're looking forward to exploring. So in conclusion, we introduced a novel interface to explore human knowledge through classification trees. We introduced that fix width prefix Library of Congress classification for simple sorting. Uh, and we introduced a content discovery experience that lets users find content they are interested in without denying the existence of content they are not interested in. So for example, even if you aren't interested in religion, that bookcase is always still going to be there. And it's not going to just disappear because we've determined you're not interested in it. And it's also not going to shrink to make to appear as if it's not as uh, influential just because you're not interested in it. You're free to ignore it if you're not interested in it, but it's, it's, it's a bit more objective in that sense. And finally, hopefully we've created a somewhat beautiful place for books online. I'd like to give a quick thank you to Mech, uh, who you just saw for constant and regular feedback throughout this process, uh, to Jim Shelton for wonderful design discussions and feedback, to Tene Ziad James from our Open Library community for providing design feedback ideas and mockups, and to the Internet Archive UX team and the Open Library community for also providing regular feedback throughout the, pro uh, the project. Thanks again for your time. Please do try out the Library Explorer if you're so inclined. And with that, I'll hand it back to Chris to lead us into Q&A. That's amazing, Drini. Uh, thank you so much for that. Uh, I see that Mech has joined us here on the on screen as well. Um, and we've had a great uh, uh, series of questions that have come in uh, through the Q&A feature. And so for uh, anyone who has additional questions, please don't hesitate to ask. And um, I did a little typing behind the scenes answering some of the questions, but I think now would be a good time maybe to, to uh, answer some of the other ones live. And Mech, I'd like to, uh, to start with you. There was a question that I uh, kind of elaborate or uh, answered a little bit, but I'd love for you to elaborate it um, on it. And that's, can you explain the difference between the Internet Archive and Open Library? Absolutely. Thanks, Chris. And wonderful job. Thank you, Jeannie, for, for that demo. Um, the Internet Archive is a nonprofit organization whose mission is to make uh, all knowledge universally accessible. Uh, it started with a project called the Wayback Machine. So one of the fundamental problems of the World Wide Web, which we would love to see solved uh, within our lifetime, is that uh, websites can change over time. Uh, but as websites change, that doesn't mean their previous versions are saved anywhere. And so every time we click save on our web page, we're basically losing history. And our founder uh, and digital librarian, Brewster Kale, uh, thought that it would be great if we were able to have incremental snapshots of the whole entire World Wide Web uh, over time. And so if you go to the Wayback Machine, uh, which is one of the websites that the Internet Archive offers, then you can browse the World Wide Web as it was all the way back to the year around 1996. So you can go to, you can view and browse a version of the World Wide Web before Google even existed, if you can believe that. Now, uh, all of these not snapshots and also many of our other resources are available on a website called archive.org. So besides, uh, besides the World Wide Web as one of the platforms that we, uh, we cr uh, crawl, we also have been digitizing with the help of, of partners uh, millions of books, um, whether they are modern materials or whether they are um, unrestricted materials uh, that might be in the, the public domain, for instance. Uh, you can think of the, the archive.org website as the source of truth for all of these materials. Uh, one of the projects that Mark Ram, one of the, the directors at the Internet Archive has been working on is a project to weave these different books that we have digitized into the web. So uh, when you go to a Wikipedia page, for instance, you might learn all about uh, uh, Ellis Island, for instance, and then see all of these citations at the, the bottom of the page. The Internet Archive would like to make it so that every time you click on a citation, there's never a dead end. You're always gonna get to that source material. 
The problem is we can't guarantee we have every book in the world digitized and we still want a pathway forward. And so openlibrary.org is a community effort, and it's a way to build a library catalog of every book that has ever existed. In a lot of the cases, we can link patrons directly to the book on archive.org. But when we don't have it, we still provide a, a variety of different options to be useful to the community and try to make it so that there isn't a dead end. One of the options is using your reading log. So you saw earlier, there's a green button that says want to read. If you click that, not only can you keep track of books for your own reading purposes, similar to what you can do on Goodreads, uh, but it also gives the, you the option to specify your intent to us. And then Chris and uh, our other members of, of the, the open libraries community can help ensure those books eventually make it into our holdings. And finally, if you uh, in the community happen to have a copy of a book that we're missing, you'll often see a donate button or a contribute button on open library. And you can click that and send us a copy and help fill in the gaps and make it a more complete library for the rest of the world. Hopefully that, that adds a little clarity into the difference between the Internet Archive, which is the parent nonprofit organization, and then archive.org and Open Library. Thanks for that great explanation, Mech. Um, I, I also uh, wrote this in the Q&A, but I'll repeat it now uh, for the video, since for some reason the Q&A doesn't uh, get captured. Um, so as a librarian, I often um, am asked the same question. What's the difference between the Internet Archive and the Open Library? And I try to explain it like this, that the Open Library is like the card catalog. It's where we store our bibliographic metadata, and we have information for more books than we have scanned, just like you might in a, in a card catalog. And then the Internet Archive and archive.org is like the stacks. It's where we store the scanned books that are connected to open library. So card catalog and stacks is a kind of a shorthand the, uh, way that I try to differentiate bet between the two. Um, the next question, uh, I, I will uh, ask Drini for this. Uh, and I think you showed it a little bit in your uh, in the interface, but it's good to, good to repeat it. There was a question uh, about being able to browse by language and subject. Is that possible in the Explorer Dream? Exactly. So the way that's uh, that will be once uh, we release these changes, so I can quickly um, show that do, do, do here. Um, so with I can do it on this filter here, but we can filter by language. There is a bit of a caveat where this language filters by um, works that have any addition in this language. So even if I filter by German, I will see books potentially in English, books potentially in English. Uh, maybe I shouldn't filter with the biodiversity collection. Maybe they don't have German books. Uh, but so with German books, so you'll see lots of books in English, but it means they have an addition in German, which is kind of confusing. So having an option for like original language, which is something we can't do yet, would be would be very useful. And otherwise, yeah, any subject will work. So uh, you can do so something, I don't know, subject. Uh, I think it's LGBT month, so we could do like LGBT. Um, maybe K might be better. Okay, well, maybe that's that's not a great search, but but yes, any subject will work here, and biography is the one I tend to use the most. A follow up question, uh, Drini: What what languages does Open Library support? Are there any languages that it that it doesn't support? So, in terms of languages we support, it's pretty much whatever books are. If we have a book in it, we support it to some extent, and we can filter by books in that language. In terms of the interface. Uh, it's mostly English. We have a project and one of our goals for 2021, it, 2021 is to expand our internationalization and support more languages for our interface. The core open library interface does have options and I think like French, German, Spanish, and a few other languages uh, to change the interface into those. Library Explorer is currently English only, but we definitely want to push to have it be more accessible to an international audience. Great, let's um, go back to Mech for the next question. So um, does the Open Library Explorer work for any collection or just for uh, books that are in Open Library? Yeah, that's a, a great question. One thing that we would love to see, especially as I mentioned, because so many of our, our physical partners have had to close their doors because of the coronavirus, is ways for our partners to present their materials online in a way that is faithful to their physical collections. And so something that Drini has been working 
really hard to, to organize, especially because Dorini manages all of our search infrastructure within the Open Library Project and our classifications is uh, we have a, a, a handshake between the archive.org website and the Open Library website where we share some strategic metadata. And one of the pieces of metadata that we share between those services is the collection label. And so for instance, uh, if the Universal School Library or the Biodiversity Heritage Library has a collection on Open Library, uh, or on sorry on the the archive.org uh, website, then we can use this the collection string from the URL as a mechanism to facet our library and turn that into a biodiversity heritage library. We also do have subject labels within Open Library, uh, but it's really the archive.org collection string which is uh, enabling us to provide this service for partners. Something we would love to see is if you are a partner of the Internet Archive and have digitized materials with us and would like a way to present your books using the Library Explorer for it to become your own interface, then please uh, do reach out to us. Uh, we'll give you some information about how you can contact us uh, and so that we can work with you to develop this out further. Uh, Mech, another question just came in, and it's really related to this. So I'm wondering if you could uh, take it as well. Um, and this is one that comes up a fair amount uh, among the groups that we work with. Are there any plans to connect with Project Gutenberg? So Project Gutenberg is a uh, a great program. Uh, in fact, we've we've worked with them in the past to to help store some of their materials to make sure that they live forever. Uh, one thing that uh, some librarians may not be familiar with about Project Gutenberg is oftentimes their text is a compilation from many different versions of a book over time. And so it's quite challenging to create a bibliographic record for a Project Gutenberg uh, work. And so oftentimes the way to accomplish that is we'll have to create a special edition for each one of those Project Gutenberg um, uh, compilations. That is something that uh, that we've thought about a lot and is is on our tentative roadmap. Uh, but I think there are still a lot of details for how that would work in order to do it correctly. Um, also, because they're not things that we have digitized, there are questions around how we would present that within our book reader. And I don't want to jump the gun and make any promises that we won't be able to achieve in this year. Uh, but something that we have been considering is a full text version of our book reader, which would make it easier to present any material, even things that we may not have done our classic Internet Archive digitization of. And so if Project Gutenberg is one of the sources that you would like to be able to view both on Open Library and in our book reader, please do send us an email and we can uh, maybe you have some context that we don't and there might be a really easy way for us to to connect those dots. We would love to. Thanks, Mac. Um, uh, I see our questions are uh, starting to slow down. So maybe the, the last synchronous one here for uh, for Drini, and it was one of the first ones that was uh, that was asked. Um, do you uh, do you have any thoughts about uh, in, in open library, like show me something random, right? Like that serendipitous browse walk down through the through the stacks and, and show me something awesome. Is that on your plan anywhere? Actually, yeah. So in one of the older mockups, uh, we had a little dice button at the bottom of the toolbar that would just sort of throw you into a random part of the library. The closest thing we have right now is that random sorting, but that's sort of your, it's still like, it depends on what you're looking at that you see random books from different sections. But yeah, I think that's a great idea because it is kind of fun to just jump into a random part of the library. Is there any chance to, to show a quick demo of the random sort? I'm not sure if we had a chance to do that during the, the demo. I think that's one of my Go favorite it. features of the Library Explorer is, is this serendipity mode. Yeah, it is kind of fun. And I, I added it uh, just this past weekend and it's been actually a lot of fun to play around with. So if you hit the random button, oh, actually, I think I got rid of one of my filters here. Let's get some uh, books published after 1985 because those usually have covers and look a little nicer. Um, so if I hit the random button here, you'll see that all the books are in uh, random order. And I can just hit the shuffle button. Wait, I think I've got some filter enabled that's showing me fewer books. No, that's okay. I can just hit the shuffle button. I think it's the subject. Oh, right. I still have that subject. 
There we go. I can hit the shuffle button and it'll just keep shuffling the books over and over again until I see something I like. And it shuffles the entire library over, which is kind of a librarian's worst nightmare, but it is kind of fun to play around with. <laughs> It reminds me much of how my undergraduate library was organized. Uh, there was a classification system, but it kind of got re reorganized on a daily basis based on uh, the on the user's browsing. Actually, one of the um, this would be a ridiculous amount of work. But would be sorry. Uh, one of the things that would be fun to add would be to sort by color. That's kind of a meme in the book world of people who sort their bookshelves by color. But that would be a pretty substantial amount of work for a joke. <laughs> I always like that. Now we've had a couple of other questions that have, um, uh, as we're as we're winding down here, um, asking about how can we stay connected, and maybe let that's a good segue uh, for us into uh, into our final slide. And I'd I'd like to off uh, let you know you both uh, Mac and Drini address how can people stay connected now that they've you know watched the Open Library Explorer demo. What's next? Mac, you wanna you wanna try? You wanna start? Sure, absolutely. Uh, I'd say the, the first step is please do take advantage of Drini's hard work by going to openlibrary.org slash explore. Try out the interface. Uh, at the bottom of the screen, when you are viewing the Explorer, you will see a, a button uh, which is labeled feedback. And one of the top ways that you can help us is please click that button. Uh, there's a form where you can put in your raw thoughts. The more feedback that you give us, that is what's going to help us refine our experience and make sure that it's working for you. Um, the second thing that you can do is follow along with updates to the Library Explorer as they come. And the best way to do that is by following us on Twitter. We post regularly to the Open Library uh, Twitter account. Uh, and then if you did appreciate the, uh, the, the demo of being able to turn the Library Explorer into something which is custom tailored for your collection, uh, for instance, the Biodiversity Heritage Library, please do send us an email to openlibrary at archive.org and we can work with you to see if that's a possibility. Uh, we are really eager right now to help our partners reopen their doors. And if they can't do that physically, we want to help you do that digitally. Um, and then finally, if you like what you see and you have some free spare time, uh, consider volunteering with us. There are so many different ways to do that. If you go to openlibrary.org slash volunteer, we give you a choose your own adventure. And whether you are a librarian, a software engineer, uh, someone who just wants to beta test our different services, this is a perfect avenue for you to spend as little or as much time as you'd like joining our community, feeling welcome and helping us build a better open library for the world. That's great, Mac. You know, we, we've had a, a series of, uh, of questions also in the Q&A asking about the video recording. And yes, this the session's being recorded and everyone um, who registered will get an email tomorrow that has a link to the session recording. And what we'd ask uh, all of you to do is to share that email, share this message with your colleagues, uh, 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 tag us on Twitter, uh, at Open Library, you know, spread the word, let more people know about this because it's really, you know, it, this is an exciting interface. This is something that's really cool. It takes me back when I like with Drini, you know, Drini's inspiration of browsing through the stacks, that was the same as mine. I worked in my undergraduate library. That's why I was so familiar with it being out of order, uh, because I helped to put it back in order on a daily basis, uh, working through this through the stacks. And that browse through a physical collection is magic. And we can't, it's hard to do that online. And so this is a good approximation. If we can't get into our physical libraries, at least we can try to approximate that way of browsing online. I guess I'd like to offer maybe the uh, final words to, to Drini. Where, where are you going? What's, what's next? Uh, okay, so we'll, with Library Explorer, I do want to see how we can, it's trying to strike that balance of having something that is uh, beautiful, interesting, and also useful. That last one is the thing of like making sure that this is something people can actually get use out of and, and derive value out of. Um, that's that's I think the the core part, and hopefully we're I think we're building something that will help uh, 
will at, at the very least put a smile on people's faces as they're browsing through and will hopefully help them find books with, uh, with less bias and get a, an idea of how much amazing stuff there is available uh, for people to learn about. And something I'd, I'd like to, to add is in software engineering, a job is never complete. Uh, there's always gonna be recommendations. And so I would like to reiterate the, the first point on the slide here that really the way to help us in this journey is trying us out and feedback, feedback, feedback. That's really the important one. And if the feedback link is, is a little too hard, our goal is no dead ends. Um, you can send Drini an email directly to drini at archive.org. Uh, we'd rather uh, we would rather receive your feedback and make it easy than get none at all. Um, and that's the best way to make sure that we're working together to provide the best experience possible. Well, thank you both, uh, Mech and Drini, for your time today, for your energy, your enthusiasm, for your creative work, uh, sharing your story. It's it's really been helpful for uh, for all of us. And thanks to uh, for all of you in the in the audience. Thanks for your time. It's a valuable commodity today, and we really appreciate you uh, showing up and sticking with us through the through this conversation. So, just a final note. Again, we will be sending a message out. Uh, you'll get an email tomorrow that has a link that we've uh, the links that we've shared throughout today the link to our slides and the link to the video recording. So um, uh, keep keep your eyes open for that. It will come tomorrow. And uh, maybe just a final note, like on behalf of Mechandrini and, and, the, and the open library community, thank you for showing up today and for your interest and your enthusiasm. Uh, we, we put a lot of effort into making our uh, site usable and responsive. And we need that kind of feedback on how to improve uh, from users just like you. So thanks again for showing up today. Thanks for your interest and we'll be in touch uh, tomorrow. Thanks again. Chris, I know a lot of work goes into arranging these. Thank you so much for your time and energy as well. Glad to do it. Thanks everyone. Thank you everyone.